All right, record. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is well. Hey, this is good chat. <laughs> like, I don't know. I think it it should be cut. All right, well, I'll, I'll cut it then. Um, yeah, but Isn't I don't know. But, but like, no, like Node libraries, some of them were developed by people who came from other languages. So it's not exactly fair to just say that. Yeah, I think some of like the early libraries and some of the like sometimes the newer ones are actually um, like look at existing implementations and try to like work off of them. But mm -hmm. a lot of times, I even like see just like total rewrites of libraries that are based off of things and ideas that work and just like done poorly. Like I think even like you could say like um, like. Uh, there's this library JS Verify for doing like property-based tests that um, one guy uh, Oleg Grenders wrote, and nowadays he doesn't really write JavaScript anymore because he just writes Haskell, and he mm -hmm. makes things like Servant and some other stuff now. But mm -hmm. then it's like people like trying to like rewrite this library in like shittier ways, even though it's like existed since like 2014. Mm -hmm. and it's like it still has like active development and everything, but. You know, just people just rewrite it for whatever super, whatever superficial reasons, and it's just unfortunate. Yeah. What what library did, what was that? Did you have one specifically in mind? Because like I'm thinking about OAuth, and like if you just implement the OAuth spec, then like you don't exactly need to do much to re-implement it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. In my case, I for that I just did it manually. It wasn't the greatest, but it's just like whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen a few libraries on GitHub where they just uh, interact with like Twitter API or Flickr, and they just make craft up the HTTP request manually really quick, and that that works. I, I'm just mostly curious on like what the OAuth spec is. <laughs> it's pretty big. Can do a lot of things uh, with it. Yeah. You can do like three different requests to get a access token, or just one sometimes. Yeah. Hello, people. Let's see, Vlad. You know, on i3, this, uh, like, every program just looks terrible. Like, every GUI program that is. On what? Oh, i3? Oh, you're talking about yeah. i3. That's Linux, yeah. Yeah. Well, Desktop at least Zoom chat and Slack are, like, broken. And, like, Zoom or uh, just both of these, like, it just looks stupid. Like, <laughs> uh, like there's just, like, a bunch of lines everywhere. Like people have like hard coding paddings or something, and I think it's supposed to like try to like just hard code like oh this is probably the height of the gnome like menu bar or whatever. But it's just oh. yeah, i three is a pretty minimalistic Linux desktop experience, isn't it? It's like you have to know all the keyboard shortcuts to do anything. No, you just configure them like like. Everything you want. It's it's like using a DWM if you used it before. Yeah, but it's all keyboards. You, I mean, to, for navigating, you can't just use the mouse to click, 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 and get to where you no, need. No, no, no. But like i3, by default, they have the um, mouse focus thing, so you can just move your mouse and it'll focus to a new pane, and then you can use. Like, oh, the okay. And whatever. But yeah, it's like got a whole bunch of features that I don't know. But then I don't know, just. Just keep on using it. <laughs> I mean, I used to use DWM, but then I heard that like there's like no development on it, and mm -hmm. I was like, I might as well use something else this time around. I'm pretty happy with like the whole Linux thing now. Like I hadn't used it for like ten years, but I don't know. It's, it's Linux cool. is so hit and miss because I I I've, I've been running Fedora on my laptop for the last uh, several months, about a year mm -hmm. now. It work, It works fine, uh, but then I, I switched to like you install Fedora and it comes with like the genome desktop environment, and then you can switch to something else at login. 
So I tried Cinnamon, Cinnamon Desktop Environment. Now that, that works pretty good, except like my I can't put my laptop to sleep <laughs> at all. Uh, like I push the power button and nothing happens. I close the lid, nothing happens. Oh, so really? at the at, so I went to the coffee shop and I was low on battery, so I had to come home. So I shut my lid and I won't go to sleep. I get home and the battery's dead. <laughs> So I lost, I lost all my tabs, all my terminal sessions. It was sad. No, I, for that, I think you probably want to make like a, a script anyways, but you should be able to find that also. Like, no, I looked like I, Google search, like what's the CLI command for putting my computer to sleep in Linux? And like, there's like four or five and none of them worked. <laughs> I, I really? It's like, I don't know what's wrong. Just close your laptop lid, should it work fine? Yeah, I closed my laptop lid and didn't go to sleep. <laughs> Uh, system control suspend. That should be it. It's... Yeah, that's what I use in a script. So like my lid, when it, if I close my lid, usually it locks and it uses like some other default crap. But I usually use i3 lock and then I have a script that sets like a background with a blurred image of like my desktop and then it does the system control shut uh, suspend. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Linux, though. I saw uh, Oscar was <laughs> complaining about Linux on Twitter, saying that it's terrible for, like, his use case, maybe video editing. <laughs> yeah, I don't Under know. Understandable. I mean, it, yeah, it's, like, everyone's experience is, like, quite finicky. I use, like, Ubuntu LTS, and I use i3 so like i haven't really had any problems and like even when i was using like gnome crap uh, just like default gnome 3 i was able to do like external displays but nowadays they just have some extra and our scripts and they just work no real complaints yeah i used to use i3 i used to use xmonad i used to use all these other things and then eventually i threw my hands up in the air and said i don't have time for this shit. Um, <laughs> I just use XFCE now, and everything just works. Really? Yeah, mm. like displays, printers, much everything. Except for scanning. Scanning is weird in Linux because every printer scanner has their own weird scripts you need to download and install. It's, I guess it's not unlike Windows in that sense. Yeah. Well, even, I don't know, my experience with it on Windows has been pretty terrible, too. Definitely. But yeah, my. My wife's computer looked at the keyboard recently and it sat there discovering the USB keyboard for about two minutes. <laughs> it all worked out. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, what, what should we talk about PureScript related? Um, uh, there's one I had in mind. I had an interesting discussion on the AF boards about. How to how to deal with exceptions in F? Um, well, it looks like Jonathan has mentioned that he has a few slides he can talk about. Yeah, I was hoping to just share a couple of slides just to kind of see what's been merged over the last like two weeks. What kind of stuff has gotten in under the PureScript organization? Oh, so good. Um, all right, I'll share my screen if that's cool. Shouldn't be too long. Yeah. All right, you can see this. So um, this got recently added. Could point from character because apparently that wasn't there before. And there's some show instances and some doc docs that were added in there. So um, I don't remember what the use case was, but it was basically we need this functionality, so that got added in there. Um, for docs, um, there's a couple things that's landed in there. So the generics are mentioned in the cannot derive part. Um, there's an error in the, in the doc site where it's like, hey, uh, if you can't derive this, then maybe you should use generic, which has some of the, some utilities baked in basically, like generic show, that kind of thing. Um, and there's quite a bit of explanation on import qualified instead of like a sentence. And now it's uh, sort of much more expanded and saying, um, this is where it's useful to, to use import qualified, which is kind of useful. Um, and the massive amount of changes that landed that Harry committed were all pursuit related. So there's a ton of changes in pursuit that hopefully should be on there now. Um, yeah. Type signatures for class members that was 
pretty interesting because before it just, it just had the name, but now it um, has sort of the type signature for the entire thing. And so just, hey, this is what the thing is. This is what the function is. And now it's got a full type signature in there, which is cool. Um, type operators, you can search for them, which is pretty cool. Um, if you just type in a search package or just type in a package in the search, it should show up as well instead of you know, no results found or something. Um, and this one I thought is pretty cool. The search results are now ordered by reverse dependencies. So sort of like popularity, if you will. Um, like if you search for map, prelude map should be the first one instead of it being like later down in the page, things like that. Um, and type variables, order by generality. This is kind of cool. Like if you type uh, A to FA, for instance, um, and there's other stuff like W to W or XW, um, the, the W one would be uh, listed further down because you really what you really want if you're searching for type variables uh, as in function definitions is you're we're assuming that you're hoping that you're searching for those things particularly. So if similar things are found, they're listed a little bit below. Um, so yeah, Harry's been very busy on this stuff, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, the pursuit has gotten so much better. <laughs> it's just that reverse dependencies thing alone has made it just great. Yeah, as somebody new, I, I got to say, I've, I found Pursuit very, very good. I, I always find what I need for him always there, so that's always great to have. What was that about the, considering the type variable names that you use? So if there's, if I say A to F A, will that, uh, like if I use A to G A, will that, would that be considered as like an F? Because usually when we do like F or G, those are kind of like those higher kind of type variable names. Or is it, it just has to be an exact match for the variable names that are used? So let me quickly find that because there's an example um, that's there. So it's this bug that was here, which references 293, which is kind of neat, I thought. So the example that's given here is hey, if I'm looking for A to B, F, A, F, B, um, currently this is what the order that gets uh, returned. But you'll notice the top one is like W to W, which could possibly match A to B, right? Which sort of makes mm -hmm. sense, but it's much more general in that sense. So in this case, the specific matches are match are uh, going to be displayed first, like A to B, F A, F B, and then same thing here. But then this one's slightly more general, but it's still less general than the bottom ones over here. So it's just the ordering of the results based on what you typed in over here. Uh, influence the ordering, which from a searchability standpoint just makes things a little. Yeah, that's nice for linking too. So if you want to send somebody to, you know, the the right results on the pursuit, you can tweak the variables so that yeah. it, it uh, brings that brings it to the top. Yeah, let's just go take a look at this. Shall we? So yeah, now it's A, B, F, A, F, B. And over here, the general one's a little bit lower. I'm not sure why this is still here. I feel like it should be further down, but maybe it hasn't quite deployed yet. I don't know, <laughs> but it's up there. Yeah, it's, it's still not a perfect search. Um, it'd be nice to do, to tie into uh, the type tools that's built in the compiler itself, but yeah, <laughs> I don't work with pursuits, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's super nice to uh, see that. What, what was on the first side that you showed, Jonathan? Um, code point from characters, or code point from char and pursuit uh, pers in pure script strings. Because one slide was about pursuits, one was about documentation, yep. and then there's a third slide. That was just, um, yeah, this one. Okay, strings. Yeah. Yeah, we have, we have a pretty good uh, strings package. Um, but yeah, yeah, the, yeah the, a lot of uh, improved documentation to the prescript documentation repo. 
I yeah. think there's still some that are open that need to be merged. Yeah, there, there probably are. Um, I just covered sort of what was already merged in so far. So. Mm -hmm. I hopefully we can do this going forward as well. On the yeah. Recap. Um. Yeah, I guess I could show uh, uh, my my progress. I like I've been working on this PureScript OAuth library. Um. It's still not comp not quite done yet. I'm still playing around with it in pseudo code form. Uh, but I was hoping I could you know, clean up quite a bit in the next two weeks. Uh, we can maybe uh, try implementing it for a few different APIs in the next hack session in two weeks. Um, I'll try and share my, oh, I can't share. I'm using Wayland. Linux Wayland, I need to use X. Oh, I can't share a screen, that's sad. Oh, that's news. Oh, well, I guess I can push to GitHub and I can show you guys there. You want one of us to share our screen and then you can just talk us through it. Um, yeah, sure. What your are? Um, github.com slash checks or slash script. <laughs> that worked. You have it in chat. The link. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, like, the goal of this one is to ultimately do, implement the Open ID Connect, also, but uh, start with o OAuth two because Open ID Open ID Connect is OAuth two. But it adds a few more specifications on like what what, what tokens are turned and what scope options there are. Uh, so if you actually go to like the OAuth two spec page, uh, it's pretty well laid out and pretty concise. So that, that makes this kind of a fun project. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah. But the uh, one one problem is that the description that the spec has. It's not like doesn't have a lot, a lot of pseudo code. <laughs> so you you kind of have to Invent concepts. Um, yeah, uh, you can like properly type the request arguments and the requests and the responses and the error types. But uh, as far as like how you connect these, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but yeah, it's it's fun to try and piece the puzzle together. Uh, so OAuth can be kind of compli com uh, complicated from uh, a certain flow. Like there's there's multiple OAuth flows. Um, like you can just send your client ID and client password and then just immediately, immediately get back an access token that you can use to uh, get data. Uh, and then you can also like go through like a two or three step process where you have the user go and sign in on a, uh, and then, and then you get in like an authorization code and then you could get to send the author and then the authorization code comes to you in the callback. So, after you direct the user to the auth page, you have to like open up a HTTP server and listen for the token to arrive. And then once you have the auth authorization token, you can get an access token. And then you, you can do like a refresh token to get keep your access token permission to use it again. So there's lots of different ways you can get access to a protected endpoint. And I'm just trying to make it as uh, type safe as possible. So that across the, for example, where you have to like send an authorization request and then come back with a uh, authorization token and then use that token to, to make an access token request. Uh, like we can kind of type those two operations, like those two asynchronous requests, we can kind of ensure that 
like what comes back from the authorization token is what's sent on the uh, access token request. Um, yeah, because the authorization endpoint and the token endpoint, they both return different types of uh, data depending on what you want them to return. There's like a parameter that's at, uh, that specifies what you want them to return. Um, yeah, so it's kind of complicated. But uh, hopefully I'll get this cleaned up uh, and we can maybe try and implement it on something at the next hack session in two weeks. Cool. Because mm -hmm. uh, it seems like most people, like there are people that are using OAuth from PeerScript, like no problem. <laughs> uh, some people will just maybe use some JavaScript node middleware and just kind of magically get it. Um, others will just manually craft an HTTP request and just get it that way. And that, that's all fine, but you know, if, they, if, if they want something that's a little bit more well thought through, this would be a nice resource to have. I'm like, yeah, right now, none of this, none of this doesn't compile at all. It's just still pseudo code. But yeah, just try and stick with it, stay with the spec. Nice. So you're waiting for it to, how much you got left to do? Quite um, let's see. So off is massive. <clears throat> you can go to, go back to the readme. There's a readme for OAuth 2. Um, so I'll go down, because like on, on section four, section four is a peanut authorization. This uh, describes the four different flows that are part of OAuth. I've got down to the second or third part of this, and then that's pretty much done then. Cool. Um, like, just this fourth bullet point. Um, that's the majority of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. That'd be handy. So, you're doing it all purely from the front end, I guess. From a front end? Yeah. Um, you can use OAuth from like the back end point of view too. That's, uh, if you use an OAuth client that's in the back end, then that's called like, uh, the client type is called confidential. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's certain flows that you use for confidential clients uh, in here too. And hopefully, hopefully the notes I take should be able to describe it pretty well. Yeah, but uh, you, from the if you want to make like a JavaScript app or a PureScript app and it runs completely in the browser, then that still follows the like there, there's still uh, a, a flow that's supported by OAuth for that, and that's called like uh, that client is called a public client, and there are uh, flows you can use for that. Um, I think it's like the authorization code, like the most complicated OAuth flow I think is made for uh, those browser. Apps and I think na native apps use the same flow because the code is running in an untrusted environment. The browser is untrusted environment. Like the user's device is an untrusted environment. So or like whatever is is in there, like you have to kind of control uh, some of the permissions of the tokens. Sweet. Mm -hmm. Boop. Um, one one other thing I. Um, I think is worth talking about is uh, uh, there's a thread in AF. Um, I don't know if I can find that link for you. Okay, yeah. I think it's the one I linked in chat. Oh, good, yeah. Uh, yeah, issue 136. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. I imagine this is kind of like a common question that app users have. Because um, if you've used app at all, like you've heard that there's the error channel, <laughs> right? And then there's, yeah, so you can just kind of, if you have a value in app, you can kind of just uh, throw on the error channel and that value just kind of goes away. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I've been kind of curious about like how that's intended to be used. 
and why that is. Because like just throwing ex like that that's kind of equivalent to throwing exceptions. And that's not exactly like the peer script or the Haskell strongly typed way of doing things. Like you can, but generally if it's something that you're kind of expecting, uh, you just return an either where the error is in the left hand side of the either, and then your successful value is on the right hand side. And so I consider like that that either returning is kind of like the idiomatic way of doing things in peer script. Um, Right, but it's so easy to throw an error to change the either EA into just an A, just throw that error into the error channel in, in F. It's just so easy to do that. So, um, like, okay. in some of my code, like, I just, I just do that. Like, it'd be, so much, it'd be so much nicer if this F just returns the, an A. Like, I don't, it'd be nice if it didn't have to return the either EA. So I just, like, throw the E, <laughs> and then it gets gone. And then, so that's, that's kind of nice. Um, yeah, so I was kind of curious about uh, like how the app was intended, like how that error channel was intended to be used. And there's kind of some interesting discoveries I made when researching this. Um, like in JavaScript code, if you throw it, if you throw an exception, uh, that exception can only be caught in synchronous code. So if you have like a throw block, and then inside the throw block, you just throw. Like in, in, if you throw inside a try block, then you can catch it, like right there. But inside the try block, if you uh, call an asynchronous function, then like you never return to that to that original try block again. And like and uh, like in the node side, like you're in this event loop thing, uh, so you'll, you'll never go back. So if in an asynchronous function inside of a try block, if you like throw, then like you'll never, like you can't catch it. So that's why in node JavaScript callback code, uh, there's two callbacks. There's one callback for the successful value and one callback for the error value. Um, and so this, this, this got, yeah, so it's easy to, it's, it's important to remember that, uh, that, that, uh, error callback, um, uh, that's what becomes that error channel in the AF. So um, like when you run the AF, you have to kind of hand handle that error, but otherwise uh, it's kind of invisible. And it's, so this got me thinking like in JavaScript land, like they don't really have idiomatic way of returning errors in functions. Um, like in peer script, we just return either, but there's no like common data structure in JavaScript for doing this. It's not, yeah. So I've, I've seen in a lot of JavaScript code, it, it, like they just use the error channel as just a general, like they just throw stuff there all the time. So if you call an asynchronous function with a missing argument, they'll just throw on the error channel. It's like, hey, you're missing something. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not the right way to use an error channel. Like, that, that, that's supposed to be for exceptions, like truly exceptional events. Um, so I think it's important to like have uh, a distinguish between how the error channel is handled in node code and how the error channel should be used in pure script code. Like functions, like programs can fail just for like runtime reasons. So you can't get rid of that exceptions. You, know, you just can't get rid of it. You have to have it there. But you don't have to, like it's nice to not have to worry about it. So like I'm kind of curious if we should <laughs> be educating ourselves that we might want to convert from the node style idiomatic error handling to the peer script style idiomatic error handling. Um, yeah, anyways, I think this is an interesting discussion that I've never, I've never like really considered before. And I'm curious if other people have come across this concept. So one thing where you just said, I can just, uh, well, if you have an E, the EA, and, and you're in that inside app, you just throw the E. At that point, you're probably not dealing with idiomatic pure script code in the first place, because that E needs to be the error type, which is like the JavaScript exception. Right? Yeah. It can't be like some properly defined error data type. But you, you can, can just create that in pure script. You can just like, Render some error to a string, and then just yeah. put it into an error object, and then throw it. Yeah, but at that point, you've you've already rendered two strings. You're not in metric first <laughs> <laughs> so, Yeah. Uh, 
But yeah, I mean, and Haskell doesn't have this as well, right? It's not like this is unique to PureScript or anything. Haskell uses asynchronous exceptions to kill threads, for example. So you, they are like, in I.O. in Haskell, you can always throw exceptions. And um, is that like what they tell is in Haskell? If you're writing like this asynchronous code or stuff in you know, threads, I/O. Yeah, yeah, everything with with, with I/O basically is allowed to throw exceptions. Well, it's allowed to, but do they say that that's the way to do it, or should you just return your either's? It's like what should go in an either and be returned versus that's what a, what should be thrown. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty much discussed, like that's a, there are different opinions on that matter. Mm -hmm. um, but in, yeah, I mean, if the, if you like, I think the general or like the most usually applied rule is if you, if your user might want to catch and handle that exception, in that case, you probably return it as an either, um, or you make it explicit by a monad error. And if you don't expect the user to want to handle that exception, then you make it an exception, which is then violated by packages like text, which will throw exceptions if your data is not valid, UTF-8 dates or something. Uh, but yeah, it's a bit of a slippery slope. Like, definitely don't use F's error handling, uh, like F's error as a way to to propagate application logic errors. Yeah, I've come to understand that. But when I was first entering F, there was no warning like that. And they just say, F has an error channel and F has a success channel. I'm like, oh, great. So errors channel is where I put my errors. <laughs> so, but maybe that's not a good idea. Yeah, I guess that's not uh, too well documented in the README, even though, well, it might actually be the right place to document this kind of stuff. Like, I mean, the README documents how you can actually, like how apps are ending works, but that you should avoid it if possible. Probably not. Yeah, documented too well. Also, does our Ajax client usually throw exceptions if something fails? Does it not return results? Or Ajax? Either. Yeah, because that's the example I see in the README. Oh, like, I think that's true. Uh, if you make an XHR request and it returns a, like a not found HTTP response, then I think that goes in the error channel. Uh, and I don't think it does, actually. Like it, it does so if, because I mean, I've I've used it and I think it goes to the error channel if you cannot parse. So basically, if you get if you expect it to be able to decode JSON something, then it will go to the error channel because decode JSON can't do that on nothing, right? Because when you get a four hundred four or whatever, then you get nothing from it. But uh, if uh, personally in, in in our code base, I went around that by always expanding it as a string and then doing the decode myself because I don't want like a 404 I want to decode that as an either and my own error type. Whereas if network is down, then I'm okay with it throwing an error, right? And for me, there's a dis distinction, right? If it cannot even start the request or something's wrong with the browser or the network, then sure, throw an error and I'll catch it somewhere in main or whatever. But if it's like a 404 or 500 or whatever other HTTP, but something that I get from the server, then I kind of want to get an either left from it. Yeah, and it's pretty widely agreed that the error, uh, like the decoding thrown exceptions was a mistake and in FJX, and it's going to be changed uh, so that the decoding is no longer part of the, like using the type class mechanism, which is dodgy at best there. I think, yeah, FJX is pretty complicated because, because of that, like what you mentioned. But I've, I've been trying to make a different wrapper around the XML and HTTP requests in the browser. And it's complicated 
because before you send the request, you have to like say what the type of the response is. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. It's always kind of nice. It's always best to just presume it's going to be a string because in application code, that's just like you just parse it yourself. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's the reason that the abstracts is so complicated is because this XHR thing that we're going to have to specify the return type. Because the browser wants to help you parse it too because it's got C libraries that can help you. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I have an, like my own API over that that does, I, I don't actually use stream for my application as the result of that. I just like from that, I, I transform to an either my own error or my decoded things, right? That's just a small layer in between objects and the rest, which hopefully, as Chris Rick said, will hopefully get changed when it's version and that we won't need that anymore. Yeah, it's just one of those gutchats, right? Every like this, the only good way to use the API basically is avoiding some part of the API and writing it yourself. So you should just remove that part of the API so that you always have to write it yourself and you can't get it wrong anymore. Hey, Christoph, have you ever used uh, the AFJAX algebra library? Like I, I've, I've, yeah, uh, I've looked at it works. a few times, but the like the docs are kind of. <laughs> Docs are kind of lacking, so I can't quite figure out like how do you. How yeah, I use it every day at work, basically. Um, oh yeah. I mean, it's seven layers below where I usually work, so I don't see it, but mm -hmm. I know that I'm using it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. It's basically just it makes it um, easier to embed abstract stuff into your own DSLs if you define them with free, or if you're defining them with free. Mm hmm. So, but it's not meant to be like the second version of AFJAX? No, 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 no. It's just, um, it, it's there to help with when you, like one pretty common pattern is to define like these application DSLs with free and the, the AFJAX F thingy is like, it's called a pattern functor, but it just means that you can embed F into your, like, sorry, AFJAX stuff into your, into your DSL without automatically running it as effectful code. And so you can decide to interpret it later in one batch with your other DSLs. So it's not really um, something that you should grab and use instead of FJAX. It's something that you'll want when, when you're trying to embed FJAX into a bigger free DSL using application. OK. Got a sort of related question, Ajax. I guess <laughs> more, more with like the UI stuff. I'm just curious, like how to sort of how to think about doing this type of operation where um, you know, like if you're on Amazon, you log in and you do your you search or whatever, and then you go click on some important screen like your orders or something. You're trying to do something like change your payment. It will automatically like um, ask you like, hey, since you we're away for like 15 minutes, we be required to sign in again uh, to verify that like, you know, this is actually you. Um, like how would you design a component, I guess, say in Halogen or Pux or anything really, um, to sort of do something similar to that where like if you have a component that's on screen, you click something, you redirect another component. I guess you do a network request and the network request is like, hey, you need to sign in. So at that point, how do you handle that bit to then sort of bubble up and show you a different screen, I guess, and then make you progress? I would expect that, like, I would expect there's an Amazon API that when you request that page, it says, hey, you've not logged in for 15 minutes, so you'll probably need to do that again. So you'll probably get something other than a 200 request would probably get some 400 error message or something, or in which case, you, like from your FJAX, you'd get an error and then you'd render it differently. Depending on what response, so got. they just serve. They just store that uh, state on their Amazon servers, right? 
I mean, it would be very uh, like prone to hacks if they didn't, right? Because if it's up to the client, then you can write your own client that doesn't that just doesn't do that, or small JavaScript code, right? Or mon grease monkeys or whatever, right? So I'm I'm quite sure they would not do it on the client side. That's part. Yeah, that that'd be kind of odd. So like, yeah. let's say you're filling a form out, just a random thing, right? Let's say you're filling a format, you hit submit, and now instead of like it going through, it's like, hey, you need to reauthorize. Like, is there a good way? Is there an example somewhere where something similar is done, where you sort of pause the state of the execution, you go somewhere else, and then you resume, like if it's successful? So, so if you're inside Halogen, you'd probably use an overlay there, just so that, like the old component just stays where it is, and you, it's like you're not deleting all the fields. Um, okay. And then the way you'd probably do that in a bigger Halogen application is that that overlay thingy is like hooked in somewhere at the global level. And he used the bus, the buses to bubble that message up all the way. Like it's not bubbling up; it's just sending it straight to the top, instead of having to go through the component hierarchy. Because oh, could you the parent of the parent of the parent of your component probably yeah. doesn't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you point me to that bus thing? I'm not. I don't think I've seen that. Because that, yeah, that I that's like very, less work to do. I have a very simple example. I was just posting today and. In the uh, Slack channel, let me find it. But it's not exactly that, but it's basically like this is the, the link in chat for the whole repository. But like, you, can, uh, you can share your screen if you want to show something. Um, yeah, I could probably do that. One second. Uh, let me find the button. So it's in the middle, of the bottom, yeah. the green one. I'm just looking for the right page to share. Hopefully, this is uh, the one. Are you seeing the. Uh, how do an example? Yep, that works. works. Great. Okay. Uh, so basically, there's this uh, dialog DSL that's uh, just hey, show dialog with some options where you can add like the title, message, and the list of actions, which is pretty much like name of action, which is basically the name you would put to your, on your button, and then a uh, uh, M unit, right? You, you you run an action under a monad, which could be F or F or like whatever you want, right? And then we need an instance of it for uh, Halogen M because they probably want to run it inside an eval. And then um, let's see. Inside your monad, you probably need to store it somehow, right? In a some sort of free uh, functor. Um, and you need to like lift it inside your uh, monad. And then the way I, I use it that is I use the uh, behavior uh, to push a uh, like the options up to main. Uh, tell me if I'm going way too fast. I hope I'm not. Oh yeah, and since we're uh, uh, storing it as our monad, then we have to like fold free the whole actions from our applications monad to F again, right? So we're running inside the <laughs> natural transform. We're doing another natural transform because we have to transform it right back to uh, back to an F that uh, halogen knows how to run. Uh, yeah, and then in inside the main, we just like uh, we simply create the event and then listen for it. And if we get a show dialog, then we push it to the top level component, which is just as Chris was saying, uh, it's a, a like a router of some sort or like a main component, which basically whenever he receives the or it receives like actually the show dialog with the options, it's probably it's just gonna like overlay. Uh, uh, where is it? Like it's gonna inside uh, here is gonna put the options in in its state and then uh, oh, where is it? Oh, it's here, right? And then you have it. It has a child dialog component which it will overlay with CSS on top of it and show it, right? So like it's 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 a lot of code, and if you're not very used to halogen, then maybe it's <laughs> hard to follow. Uh, I don't know, like take too much time with this, but. It, it's basically all here in, the, in this uh, in this example repository. So if you wanna have a look, it's it's not that long to to go. Oh, definitely, yeah. And it has I think it has a like I, I wrote a bit of like a readme here, so it should be pretty. Oh, cool. Thanks. Yeah, that'll give me something to look into. Yeah. Well. Yeah, and uh, like important thing to notice is that you didn't have to go through the hierarchy because you like. Had a, you, you just use the side channel, which is like the whole monad situation that you that you have, like is allowed to is built into halogen that you can kind of use and build 
build your own application out of. Hello, I'm like, what's going on? So, it's an awkward silence. Hey, just jumped right in there. Hey, Rob. Bye. <laughs> Sorry, it's like eight forty, and it's the weekend, so you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, we just finished talking about some halogen stuff. Cool. I'm just catching up on the agenda. So. I was wondering mm. if everyone is if anyone is using the new um, Atom language server protocol thing. I was wondering how well that's working. Just because I'm thinking about switching the Emacs plugin to use the Emacs version of the LSP stuff. Are you talking about the, because I think uh, uh, Ann Wolverson was working on that a while ago. Well, he's, yeah, he's been working on it for a while and he's switched it over now so that all of the, like it's on the stable Atom channel now where they, Use the new Atom IDE thingy, which I think is from New Clyde or like evolved out of New Clyde, which was Facebook's set of Atom plugins components, and that's using the language server protocol now. And I was just wondering if there's anything that, like that, seems like the protocol is is not supporting it, which used to work before. Because like if it's if it just continues working, then I will see if I can switch over the Emacs thing as well. Maybe we can like slim down the plugins for the different editors a bit and just end up with like share a lot of the implementation inside PCIe instead of having like re-implementing it inside the editors. Yeah, I haven't I haven't used that too much. So, a quick question. Sorry, if you you, so you mentioned PCI ID server. Oh, sorry, PCI ID. I'm a little yeah. confused as to um, there's the the language. Sorry, there's PCI PC PSC ID server uh, or whatever it's called now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah. And there's the um and there's the thing Marcus all came with in terms of you know he's the language server. He's how you write a language server, uh, and you know talk to your editor, etc. Um, <laughs> I'm completely behind in terms of whether there is, well, the, uh, you know, the the peel script thing is going to talk uh, the Microsoft thing, or if it's just its own thing that works with the peel script plugins, and that's okay. I, I just wasn't sure what what had happened, or if anyone had any sort of vague plans, or you know, that kind of thing. Just curious. Uh, so what Nicholas did, so the IDE server thing that's inside the compiler does not speak the language server protocol. It speaks some homegrown JSON protocol, um, which, but what Nicholas did was he wrote a wrapper around that, which calls the original server and then just responds in the format that the LSP thing is expect, right? Um, and the way the the IDE server is like structured right now is it's like basically it's it's pretty pretty trivial to have like a different executable or like just maybe just a flag on the IDE server to just tell it to speak the language server protocol instead. Because it's like split off into like a library and an executable and right now the executable passes through commands. Like it passes the JSON into this command format and passes it through through the library. But you could easily just put like a different server at the front which parses the language server protocol and then passes the appropriate commands through that it needs to assemble the right result. Cool. Well, thanks for the summary. Uh, I really need to, to get into, uh, okay, I have some, uh, some Vim, cobbled together Vim set up thing that has like, you know, syntax highlighting. It's like, it's <laughs> a little more 2018, a little less 1993, 1980s. When did syntax highlighting become a, a common thing? Like, I had it in VB1. Cubasic didn't have it. Uh, I did, did Ball and C++. Did, I'm going to stop now.
I remember my database teacher at, at university having source code inside her Word document, and they were having syntax highlighting, which means she went through and actually selected text in there and gave it colors because Word doesn't do that by default. You sound like me giving it formatting keynote presentations. Oh no, my secret shame. I haven't. <laughs> it's always the last minute. It's like, I haven't found the tool to do this, but I've got 20 minutes to do this. I'm going to go and format everything. Um, maybe the teacher had the same kind of. Uh, all right, got it. <laughs> if, you, uh, if it supports like format color pasting, then you can just uh, copy paste code from VS Code into Google Docs, at least. Why is installing VS Code? And when you've got 20 minutes, it ain't going to download. <laughs> but I, thank you. I'll, I'll keep that tip, uh, to a tip under advisement. I'm, uh, I've, used, I've used the online version of what's the Python thing that colors stuff? Python syntax highlighting? So pigmentize? Pigment, yeah. Their website does the highlighting, and you can copy paste from there. That works into Google Docs, at least. That works pretty well. Cool. Is, is this thing recording, by the way? Have I been moralizes as <laughs> the guy who made all this I'm recording. <laughs> I can edit the Fucking down. All right. All right. <laughs> I swear enough, we stop the <laughs> So uh, speaking of halogen, is, um, has anyone tried uh, Spork? Sorry, you know PL script pucks uh, and reusing reacts and there's PL script uh, spork which is basically Elm slash pucks uh, but using halogen VDOM and but and has no JS dependencies. I'm just curious because I, I haven't put it through a spaces yet and I'm just kind of curious. I think it uses a halogen like free monad thing for effects, but I could be talking out of my bum. So uh, I'm just curious if anyone's seen it or tried it before. Okay, I'll let you know <laughs> what to try. So it's a Nate Fabian creation. Um, as something doing his spare, in his spare time, I think, in amongst you know all the other things he does. My God, <laughs> I'm a little bit scared by the pure script community sometimes. Everyone just does so much. Well, Nate is kind of crazy. Yeah. Alex and I were talking about sport a little bit. Um, just as, as something a, a little bit more flexible uh, in like the, the kinds of effects that, that it can have. Um, but I haven't gotten a chance to really get my fingers into it yet. So. Yeah, one of the most interesting things about Spork is that instead of forcing you to use the AF monad for all your actions, you can just, you know, it uses the PureScript run library, I think, where you can just it doesn't know. It but doesn't it do that yet? It allows to plug in, like, you can plug in run in there and use that as the thing instead. Oh, yeah, it, was, it just looks like run. Perhaps that's what I saw. It, it, anyways, it's got some sort of interpreter. I have to look into it closer. I think, that, I think that's the most interesting thing. Oh, yes, it does have an interpreter thing. Mm -hmm. So, what are you talking about next? I, I'm looking at the, the Google Doc um, thing with a whole bunch of jumping off points. Do want to um, pick one? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to say something. Well, one interesting thing I've had a thought about was about the H, like that, uh, like isomorphic job, JavaScript, if anybody's heard of that. It's where if you write like a React application or some program that will, you know, do stuff in your, it, it'll build your web pages for you. Then there's some advantage to having server-side rendering as well. So, like, you can't, like, if your program touches DOM APIs, then you can't just execute that on your on node to create your page. Uh, so this is, like, the motivation behind, like, the universal JavaScript or isomorphic JavaScript. Um, but it's so then how people are doing that is like just whenever a DOM API is referenced in code, they'll just do a check and like if my like if this code is running in the browser, then just use the browser API. 
if it's running in Node, then require this other module that re-implements this browser API. Um, so yeah, th this is how it's working. Like AFJAX, it does this. Uh, you can you can uh, import the AFJAX library and issue an HTTP request in the browser or in Node. And in the Node side, then it will just dynamically load in the XHR library. You have to install that on your own. Um, and then it'll issue the request. Um, but I've been thinking that like one way, a different way to do that same thing is to use like like a, like a runtime, a pluggable runtime system, right? Such that uh, your runtime system provides an HTTP client and so then you just run your code, uh, you give it a runtime system and the runtime system is customized to the browser or it's customized to Node, like this, with the server. Um, yeah, like I've, I've, I haven't seen this idea discussed at all, but I think it's a pretty good idea that could really leverage the uh, PureScript ecosystem. Like PureScript Run is effectively that, where some program can say, I want to use this, and then the runtime system, I think, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure, I shouldn't say that for sure, but that's my understanding of what Run offers is that you can just say run provides this HTTP client. Um, yeah, so if you, want, if you want to run your uh, program on the server, you just insert a PureScript run instance that uh, resolves all these modules to uh, server-side server implementations of these things. Yeah, but that's something I, I want to really try. I kind of started, I kinda started, started a, a, a project, a GitHub project for that, uh, making a generic HTTP client interface, and then once we have that, uh, I think we can just make a plugin for PureScript Run, and uh, yeah, then just delegate out to different implementations based on uh, which runtime you're using, browser or Node. Cool. Um, yeah, there's. I think there was part of some a little bit of that is why EFF originally has. I mean, had the basically the different console or sort of like um, AJAX and sort of other requests like where these things are available. But it doesn't do the. Um, it doesn't do. Yeah, what PureScript One does with the potential multiple interpreters. Um, uh, Joe, um, God, uh, Hardy. Sorry, I. I'm not really sure how to, uh, to like his his nickname is uh, Jones HF. Um, uh, he did. Um, Oh, that's sorry. <laughs> I keep forgetting his name. Is that Hardy Jones? I think his name. His name is. Uh, did a Episcope run console experiment where he just so showed you how to do with a couple of different consoles. So I just dropped it in the um, uh, in the, the chat thing. But um, yeah, yeah. I was just having a dig through and. Cool. I, I don't know if um uh, if the um Ajax would require. Uh, you could probably model the, the structure as a data structure, as in that it feels like this. It's a lot. It's a lot harder than a console, but. I, probably model the different data flows with a data structure, but I'm curious, yeah, I'm curious to see what people have done already in that regard, but. Yeah, at least if you look at like Cycle.js, there's some of the things where it's like, there's a HTTP driver, so you can kind of plug in your own driver implementation or you can work with the one that already exists. And I think there's, uh, I think there is a Node.js version of the HTTP driver, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, once you have like a general interface, then you have to cut down on all the features. So things like upload progress and whatever just don't exist there for just whatever reasons. Is this like similar to free, but sort of a little bit more on the pipe level? Just not sure what I'm asking, but it sounds mm -hmm. It's exactly free under the hood, but it uses the row type machinery to give you a nice uh, um, uh, to give you a nice interface of constructing, mixing, and like separating the different effects again. The PureScript run readme is uh, really good because it kind of describes what that is. I posted the link in. Um, Basically, run plus variant, right? Uh, sorry, free plus variant. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, and if you look at the definition of what run is, which is the second link, 
you can see that run is just <laughs> a free of variant. Uh, so again, Nate's a genius, because, and so he just <laughs> pull, pulls it all together. But, I mean, yeah, I said only variant of free, but it was so cool. So is anyone putting in a CFP in for um, PureScriptConf? Um, I haven't been to either LambdaConf or um, PureScriptConf or Conf before. I'm just kind of curious of who else is. I'm not, I haven't put anything in yet. Is the CFP for PureScriptConf open as well? I think there's a link to it on the Reddit, on, on the PureScript sub subreddit. Okay. I mean, last year was just like, just put your name into this open form and you can speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure what this is for this. Yeah, the LambdaConf, when the PureScript conf was held, I remember it being like a separate day. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was the day before the main conference. Yeah. And they somehow lost my recording. Like, they lost the recording of my talk. Wow. <laughs> oh, man. It was actually, it went so well. <laughs> That's so sad. I see some people that give the talk and they have their laptop on the stand and they just record themselves, uh, maybe on YouTube Live, <laughs> just to ensure they have the ar they have it archived. Now I, I think I understand why they do that. Yeah, I mean the talk before me is uploaded. The talk after me is uploaded. Oh really? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd I'd be mad. <laughs> just a little. But yeah, this year it's the very last day of the conference. It's like the day after the conference. Yeah, I'll, I'll most likely be there. So I guess I'll put in a CFP then. <laughs> yeah, likewise. <laughs> I agree with them um, doing the self recording. There's um, uh, it's a lady I've, I've tried to remember her name, but um, she tends to do a lot of distributed systems and operation talks. And at one of the off days conference, there was a video recording and the audio completely fucked up. It was just a bup, 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 and like you can get you can kind of hear her through it, sort of thing. And uh, as after that point, it's like I'm just going to record myself wherever I go. Of course, I did that and my Mac literally hard locked up on stage. So I record myself with my phone now. <laughs> so there are a few lessons in there. I'm not sure what they are, but um, oh, man, maybe I should go back to Linux. It's probably easier. It's... Yeah, I see IS, ISFP uploaded a few videos on their YouTube channel just the other day. And audio quality on the one or two I watched was almost non-existent. <laughs> maybe that's some audio problems, but... It makes it really hard to watch when you can't uh, hear. Just read the slides. No, just wait. I mean, the quality goes. of all the Lambda Cup recordings is great. Um, they just seem to have lost like yeah. two or three, which is which includes mine. I mean, the PSG one, what Cup was also like put in like on the side, so it wasn't like the main event. Oh, um, here's a very pointed question. Um, there's like no tests in the halogen repo. How do people write tests, or do you ever write tests? For halogen specifically, or? Yeah. Well, for halogen, I'm not. I would under like I would understand how to test, for example, the VDOM library by just throwing diffs at it and seeing that it produces the correct DOM afterwards. But that's not inside halogen. Right. Halogen has all the lifecycle stuff. Yeah, I guess I'd be asking for the eval. I guess because that's the most important part, really. Is just 
your state management basically and then with the facts yeah. and whatnot. I guess a ton of examples, but yeah, I mean, this don't make the build fail. Uh, so kind of test basically being like more stateful type of things where like, oh, I received this event. Okay, now I have to go do like an Ajax call or two. And then depending on those values, I have to correctly update my state uh, so that the next render cycle shows the right thing or whatever. But mostly that, that state manipulation coupled with effects. Yeah, so one thing we've started doing, like if you use the free kind of way of, I don't know, delaying int interpretation of effects, um, that's one thing we started doing in Slum Data is where we um, now have mock versions of our different DSLs, like mock interpreters, which don't go on the network, but like you can return mock results or something. Um, okay, so like basically using the free along with uh, yeah yeah there's an example in the <laughs> gen one they're user free okay that's good to know because yeah right now all my stuff is like in the email code <laughs> so yeah it's always like it, it also depends kind of like how easy your code is to test i don't know we're building like an ide thingy so it's like you you usually do get the junk like if you ask for the gorilla you get sorry if you ask for the banana you get the gorilla holding the banana as well um, and now testing UI is very tricky business, which is why we just use end-to-end -end testing primarily. Yeah, that's what I would do too. Do you, it's you know, not, is it's not fun. End-to-end -end testing is never fun though. Yeah. yeah, so I would just do it for like the really important workflows. It's like the workflow where you collect money, it's like the money path. end to end for that. And then everything else is just like, I can just manually test that every once in a while. That's my that's my point of view. <laughs> it's, yeah, unfortunately, our application that we use at work is growing quite large. So we've got like two or three teams working on it, and it's it's basically become harder and harder. Which is why we're trying to go from Angular to something else. And I'm building out a big component of Pure Script, so I kind of want to show the whole picture. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Also. Um, the, the notion of, of all this stuff too is that um, because you've got such strong guarantees from the type system, specifically from Halogen internally, some light end-to-end -end testing, like not necessarily going through and grilling every single code path for things that aren't specific like handling money gives you a lot of assurances anyway, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, yeah, the type system is definitely a huge part of it, and especially data modeling with you know some types uh, is is huge. That like, you just don't get in JavaScript, uh, and the assertions that you get via the compiler. Um, that's definitely one big level of assurances. But the other assurance is like, did I implement this business logic correctly? That's, that's always going to be there in any language. That's kind of like where the end to end test tool should cover that though because that's going to be where your users actually you know you're mimicking how your users going to use your application so i guess that's because you you can you know you can mock test you can do all those fits bits and pieces singularly so they sit on their own or you know you can do but once you get to end to end testing then you, you're really doing journeys aren't you at that point where you're trying to mimic the user journeys i think but it's painful end to end testing is just so bad like you know, it doesn't matter what language you're in. They're just they're, it's hard to get them right, and then you you're constantly battling with different bits and pieces to try and you know get things working. Not even just because of your app, just the actual um, tooling that you you can use is really difficult to get right for sure. Um, I wish there was something better, but there isn't. So you just have to suck it up and do some end to end tests. Yeah, and, and and actually, I think that uh, like design thing is in pure script, and what we've done actually in our in our app is whenever we find a bug that the type system missed, we just try to convert that bug into a type system error, and then like kind of what you do with a unit test, right? Because when you find a bug in like non-functional programs or program pro programming languages that don't have a type system as rich as functional programming, you you write a unit test for that bug, and then that unit test is red and then you fix it, right? And then the unit test goes green and everybody's super happy, right? But like in pure script is, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it's at least possible usually to turn a bug that works now into a compiler error 
and then you can go from and that, that's how you make sure you don't do that mistake again and i think that's that really shows the power of uh, pure script a lot more than like having unit tests for me at least yeah it doesn't seem to be a big problem for me to get it right the first like to when i'm implementing to be certain that i implemented it correctly more where i'm like usually more concerned about is regressions that i've introduced possibly yeah. Um, yeah, that's a huge thing in, in Angular yes. when I was working in Angular. Regressions every day. Yeah, you don't know what you changed. <laughs> yes. I'm more scared about the CSS part of changing things, though. So, And I haven't found any way of testing that properly. So, I don't know. Um, Screenshots, boo. Yeah, screenshot diffs. Never. <laughs> don't worry. Yeah, they were talking about that on Magic yeah. Read Along. <laughs> Do not do screenshots. It's the worst thing on earth. <laughs> it's funny that there are so many projects that pop up for it. Like every every couple months, someone makes something, and then they use it for one month, and then they say deprecate. <laughs> this is so tempting. It feels ever. like you could feel like it. You could work. You're like inches away from it, but there are just so many ways it just doesn't quite work. But Hey, Christoph, did you talk about free monads in the context of testing? I, I, I might have missed that at the beginning here. You're talking about how you do testing it. I, I did, yeah. There is some parts of our app which are um, somewhat independent of rendering, which manage state that is separated from the UI state. And what we did is we used, because that's, yeah, because that's all hidden behind free monads, basically, is or like different free constructors, which are then wrapped in free. Um, what we did is we mocked out the part that connects to the UI. And so we can now run that part of the application, which handles the most complicated business logic because it involves tons of concurrency. Um, and yeah, we've separated that out. And we can run that in isolation now without requiring the browser. So we can uh, actually write unit tests for that one. So that's pretty good. So your, your your free monad is like a bunch of actions to perform on the DOM. So like in your test, you just verify. No, 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 no. The free monad is things like uh, the free monad. Like constructors involve things like um, this and this change was pushed down from the UI, and it's like a state machine. And so this change comes in, and then. Uh, what the part of the code that we're trying to test does is it forks off different requests and updates certain parts of its state. What we do is we mock out the like we mock the responses that will get to these requests and we check that it's in the correct state afterwards. And the way it works is like if once the state machine has like continued running and is in a stable state, it then pushes the state back up into the UI, which renders it. That's the part we don't test. So basically, you're using the like run your free monad, the run function for your free monad to app, and then you test that without the UI. Is that what you're basically saying? Yeah, that makes perfect yeah. I mean, it doesn't work for a test which is like form heavy or something, like an application yeah, which is like form heavy because, yeah, then your logic is going to be inside your components. In state. You could fill out the constructor that fills like mm -hmm. the, for the form data, and then you can start from there and see that it does the yeah. correct call for that or whatever, right? Continue. Yes. Like, updates the states and so on, right? So you're kind of mocking mm -hmm. the UI there. Yeah, that, that's actually a good idea. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Thank you. Please do. And I mean, coming from Angular, that's kind of like the separation they introduce is like the service part, right? And then you have to control the thing or something. And what you do is you try to unit test your services because the controllers are too tightly coupled to the UI already. And then that's kind of what we do, just that it works, unless in Ang like, I like Angular. And maybe that's where the like run would, would, would fit in very nicely, because it would be nicer for the example and like even for our code if we split at least into two, like the, uh, the monad that's dealing with the UI and then the monad that's testable outside, right? And then you'd have a co-product of those two, which would be really nice, because then you'd say, okay, I can only test, I also can like test this part, that's the, like whatever's not, everything that's not UI, which is probably easier to test. And then whatever, the UI, the QA can <laughs> have a stab at clicking things or whatever, right? Every once in a while. But yeah, that would be a good place to do it. 
Yeah, I think we'll look into that. Yeah. Probably start with the free part for business logic plus effects, just testing that. And it does help if you, instead of just having like this one big application on it that you just slap onto everything, it helps if you have break it down to more granular things because then you can, like it's easy to see where to draw the line. And you also, it helps to see when you overstep the line, when you move business logic that shouldn't be inside the component into it or something, that kind of thing. Uh, Vince asked what would the equivalent of Jest in React be, um, oh, yeah. but I've never used that, so I can't tell. Um, well, with React, it's time, time or? sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know because with with React, you can um, you can almost mimic because you you end up having sort of components. Um, you can test them. Just, to, just uh, you can set it up in a way where you can test them as sort of pure functions, and you can see that the output, what you're given, is then um, you know it's just a bunch of code. Or if you use JSX or whatever, then you can sort of check that that's the change has happened from what you've given it. So you're never actually going against the DOM itself. You're just sort of testing, um, you know, if the code changes the output of what's going to be presented to the DOM. It's kind of like parts of what it does. Um, so you're never actually doing an end-to-end -end test. You're kind of like just, but they, they don't bear well, again, with when you sort of stretch out. So I, d I don't know, what we don't really do any of that with pure script or in Halogen, do we, in terms, or is that what you just were explaining is the same? No, so, that would that would kind of like in like intervene between somewhere inside the, the virtual DOM driver, right? Where it's like, you cut off before it gets sent to the thing that patches into the into the actual DOM, and you. But um, that sounds pretty complex. I mean, it's I don't know. I'm not sure how well that works. It's effectively using a different renderer. Uh, it's using, like, for example, shallow component rendering, where you you know render the component as a something that can be then turned into a string. Um, it's, uh, and so, uh, and then doing basically figuring out if, if that changed between different iterations. Like, uh, are we talking about snapshot testing for React components, or you made assertions about the structure of the DOM uh, yeah, after no, just a different? Yeah, just what you explained. So you 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 create your own render, don't you? Um, and then you test against that. So it's not it never touches the DOM at all, does it? It's just you're just. I know it's kind of hard to explain. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, but <laughs> it does kind of sound cool, but I think like components usually contain very like a lot of DOM specific effectful yeah. stuff, like measuring the size of whatever the browser rendered or something like that, and that kind of stuff just won't work if you don't actually render to it. Oh yeah, it was it was strictly like you could do uh, I don't know if. You could do like you could test you could test like a, a search field. So you search for something, and these are the expected 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 results from that search, basically, and then yeah. how they be displayed. But it would never sort of, um, you know, it, it never cover everything. And yeah, Jest isn't that well. I don't know. It's been a year, but it used to auto mock everything, so that was fun. Um, I didn't know if that, if you could get like the equivalent. Where you could isolate basically um, part of your, you know, yeah, you have your your own read or sorry run, and then you could sort of isolate it. So you're just testing against your inputs and outputs, you know, much just like a, a function. But yeah, probably be too complicated. I mean, that kind of sounds like this. Uh, yeah, you're able to test the simple components, which you kind of is like. Yeah. I want to test the tricky bits. And yeah, yeah, no. Like, so it's not, it it works well for like you know an isolated component where it's not going to sort of be you know you don't want it to test one where you're going to be relying on on you know multiple parents and stuff like that. That then you want to go sort of end to end because there's quite a lot of stuff going on. But if you if you're purely like you can isolate a component that just does one thing like turns on and off, so then you can just go. If I do this, that's on. If I do that, that's off. But I, I don't know if we 
Yeah, I haven't felt that pain yet. I, I haven't felt like the gap of testing that is the problem. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of ways to move things from end-to-end tests in, you know, into something that feels more like a unit test because end-to-end tests just take ages. They're a pain in the ass, and It'd just be nice if you could move, move loads of that across then yeah it'd be nicer and then waiting for you know your ci and stuff to to do all of its you know before you get some sort of confirmation that you've done well usually that can reduce it you know by a good half hour if you don't have so many end-to-end tests yeah i I, we use um so we don't use a free mono based effects thing we have we have parks and it's basically locked to aff but we have the idea of like different services effectively which is Think of it as a struct parameterized by some M. Uh, and so it means we have a, a, an AFF of M, AF of M, whatever, um, or some pure one or something that we're using the same monitor, for example. And we plug those in as opposed to doing the entire plugging, uh, pluggable effects. It's crude in its own way. Um, but we've already got part of the way there in terms of yeah, giving it this, this, this mock service and how it will react to creating a post and then listing the posts and stuff like that. Um, and I'd re- uh, yeah, I'd love to be able to do something like have um, just basic interaction tests. But most of my bugs are like uh, where it does something really silly with like, a, you know, I've got a list of things I'm creating them and there is some validation logic. And ostensibly, if you had a pure renderer, it could all be pure given the fact that I've got the pure service as well. Um, however, haven't got that far We're using pucks which is obviously not halogen. Um, and uh, we are look, maybe just looking at different options for frameworks uh, just, uh, and just try and see where we can get in terms of these sort of pure testing as opposed to do it going through the entire ops mess, which we've done before with things like PhantomJS and equivalents where you run a browser and all the fun that entails. Um, uh, still figuring the shit out, man. <laughs> but happy if everyone got suggestions on, on that particular front. Um, but I like the idea of, yeah, shallow rendering is a good, I think is a useful tool and gold master kind of testing as well, where you do snapshots and just has it changed? Yes or no. And then the react people with the CSS in the component stuff means that you get better snapshots or the styling has changed as well. And basically it seems to all build on itself, but, no, I'm ranting. Anyway, <laughs> has anyone got any good testing approaches? Don't do them. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, Touch yeah, type systems that we're testing. <laughs> yeah, I, I try to lift as much as I can to the type system, and it's partly a function of our ancient pure script version, which I'm very, very shortly away from upgrading. Um, but also just I, 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 me finding difficulty lifting some things into the type system. So I end up with really silly. I'm making a new list of things and I or some validation logic has missed a thing and I, I need to get better personally lifting stuff into the type system but yeah okay I'll concentrate on that <laughs> it's, it's rough going all the same it feels but yeah I mean at least for validation logic that's usually pretty like that that you can test that without um, to me, like without rendering it, like you can just provide an input and see if it, and maybe it needs to perform some effects, but those effects usually won't involve querying the DOM, I guess. So yeah. you probably it's want to test like, that without involving, without actually instantiating the component. Yeah, there are, there are sort of a couple of pieces. There's the actual validation logic, like checking it's an email address, which is very, very separable input as the side, but because UI components seem to always be inherently stable. You do a validation, you want to keep the original value around, or you want to transition to a new validated value or something like that. But still the possibility that the user just hit pressing another button and it blows it all away. And so you always have the, this uh, stateful component to along with this sort of pure transformation kind of validation bit to it, I think. Um, and it's the wiring up of that that tends to undo me in places. And then I found I've screwed it up and go and fix it. But, I, you know, I don't have tests around this stuff. And uh, I'm trying to figure out how I can, yeah, as we go and replace bits of this, <laughs> how do I do it a better, a better the second time, basically? Uh, sorry, Christoph, I wanted to ask you, do, do you have any testing examples for halogen that you've seen? Uh, the Pure Script halogen examples folder has a bunch of examples which are great but none of them have tests they're no test folder 
Um, and I understand you're talking about mock interpreters and things, but be uh, if you know whether the, some some of those tests might show up in those example folders or not, or you know, be, it'd just be nice to have some examples hanging around, it, not necessarily in that repo itself, but just around. And if there are already existing ones, could maybe people point them out? <clears throat> so. Uh, when I create like a tiny, like a self-contained halogen component thing, and I primarily have built an autocomplete thingy, what I do is in the what I did is in the test folder there's like an example usage of the thing which creates like a web page which has all the different variations of using that component. And then I rather look at like that all of these continue to work fine, but that doesn't, yeah. I mean, that doesn't work anymore if you start combining components because at that point, like the complex, like the combinatorics, just work against you. So, and I, I don't think I have a good example of t how to test these like bigger things without going into, yeah, this is how we use WebDriver. Yeah, I think to the thing and but to the component that I'm talking about. But yeah, in the test folder, there's just an example page which has all of these like, usage examples that I'd expect. Cool. Thanks. Um, so the 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 the, um, the talking points has a zero twelve release uh, on there somewhere. Does anyone know anything about that? Um, I think it's it was said at the beginning, maybe. Was it? So what we spoke about at the beginning, Alex. What, say again? What we discussed so, at the beginning. So for zero, oh, did you already talk about zero twelve? I don't I, know, did we? Did we talk I don't think so. Oh no, go on in, someone can say it. We, we, we talked about it a little bit last month, and the result was it'll be ready when it's ready. <laughs> I'm not sure what progress there's been in the, in the last uh, few weeks on it. Um, I'm curious to know what's in that one. Is, 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 what, what, or is there going to be one before 012 to add like proxy types or something? Because I think there was some talk about breaking No, the up. proxies are removed. One the proxies out. are out. Proxies are out. OK. The proxies are out. The proxies index is out, yeah. Um, they <laughs> so the proxy syntax in itself was not bugged, but it did. There is a bug in the current type system, basically, and you, it's very hard to run into it <laughs> right now. But as soon as you add proxy types, you run into it all. Like it's very easy to run into it um, because I mean they're not proxy types. Like they're not an actual addition to the type system. They're more of like a yeah, kind of, kind of a hack, I guess. It's not, it's not a sugar? No, 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 it's not just sugar. It is. It was the only way to introduce something that was fully polykinded, kind of. But they are not necessary if you implement full polykinds. It's just harder to implement. Uh, but yeah, that's why we just ripped them out. And so now we still have instance change in there, which are pretty cool. Um, the reverse symbol append will be the one of the most useful things, I think. In that well, if you're into sure. type level string programming. Yeah, but that's awesome. Everyone should do it. It's it's fun. <laughs> and you don't have to like make some awkward ass weird type level path URL thing anymore. Because you can actually just parse the damn string. I'm really curious about the compilation times for any libraries using lots of type level string parsing. Yeah, you're going to have to wait for that to hit mainline, and then you can try it out. Yeah, I mean, Tongo already made a demo with it a while ago, and it was basically like just just like any other thing in pure script. Like, it's instant for like a couple modules. So I don't expect it to like actually cost that much to compile. I mean, of course, there will be like the time you spend in parsing and like whatever, but yeah. 
that's probably not going to be the most efficient way of parsing a string. Definitely. I mean, I guess if you want like super efficiency, maybe you should start with some hacky code gen or something. But yeah, zero twelve is the one where was the, the effect rows are going to be removed. Plan to be at least is that is that still the case? Yeah, I think there hasn't been anyone saying that we shouldn't do it. It's just that whenever we actually decide to do it, then we'll have to do the updates. Yeah. I mean, they're not, they're not going to be removed. What we'll do is we'll introduce an F type without the rows. And that one will work with the compiler just as well. So you can continue using the row typed one. But we probably won't recommend it as the default, this is how you do IO. Because oh, like a type synonym with the phantom type? That's probably not going to be a phantom type. It's going to be its own type. It's just that there's going to be like one F, like we have, well, we're, going to, we're going to have control mode at F and control mode at F row type or something. It's just a different type um, with easy conversions between the two, right? Because it's just at the type level. Like the difference is essentially just at the type level. Um, the reason it has to go like that has to be synced up with the compiler release is because you need to add the inliner rules that we have for F with rows. You need to add that for the F without rows as well, or otherwise your code is going to be slow. So is the type, what's the type of main going to be? Is it going to be a, like a main, a main colon colon EFF unit where EFF is the, the unrowed yeah. one or? Yeah. Okay. Well, you can have whatever type you want for main, right? Just because it doesn't control. Uh, yeah, main. technically, but <laughs> <laughs> right. what is uh, it? But yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, it, it, it might just as well be main console console unit if you use the index row instead. The runtime representation is going to be the same, so it won't matter for whatever JavaScript calls it. It's just a thing going to be like the effect rows are a thing you're going to be opting into instead of them being like the default because it trips up beginners so much. And it's not really that huge a benefit. Um, yeah, Th they just don't seem to pull their weights. When we have things like Puska Run, which actually give you additional structure that you can use instead of just a marker row, which makes your diff messy. Well, the worst part about uh, extra types that don't give you guarantees is just that, that they don't give you any guarantees, so just noise. Also, uh, if you make instances for anything and like you have to use that monad f, it's like the worst feeling in the world. It's like the worst version of type equals ever. And it's, well. Yeah, monad EFF is also arguably wrong, but there are some things you can write in EFF that you can then write in AF and behaves completely differently. And I don't know. Is that so? Sorry? Really? I remember, I, I remember writing, uh, writing some code and was like, oh, I could totally do this as uh, EFF and uh, it might have been the other way around. I'm sorry, I'll stop talking shit now. I'll go and dig out the example. It's from like 12 months ago. I think uh, generic is going as well in zero as well. I think there's already been those. Yes. Yes. Uh, so generic. generic is now the thing, and generic in the compiler basically just change a bunch of imports, I think. Um, it does work very differently, generic rep, oh, because oh, okay, it, yeah, right. it does not need to traverse the entire structure anymore. Like It doesn't need to need everything below the type you want to direct generic for it to be also direct generic. Instead, it does one level at a time. So that means like, if you have a record with four fields and three of those have types which you want the generic rep version for, like <laughs> the one that continues going down, you can do that. And for the fourth field, which does not have a generic 
representation that can, can, can be converted into a show, you just define the show instance yourself, and that's fine. And that works. That's fan fucking tastic. I love it. All right, good. <laughs> yeah. I it's, like basically real time. It's, ba it's basically how GHC does it. That's GHC generics, yeah. I'm not the really good change with the generics will be that the generics rep won't drive the thing for records anymore. So because we have row the list, we have like a superior way to work with records. So that's also going away. So that will be like, like actually amazing. For Clearly superior. <laughs> Clearly superior. <laughs> <laughs> the road to the road list name is now scrolled. Sorry, <laughs> there's a, a this chat in the in my yeah. Road list is too good. If anyone wants to contribute to my repo and especially to the meme section. So <laughs> yeah, it's a great repo. If you find any links that aren't in there, please do add them. Especially memes, like Justin said. Yeah, I have some like more blog posts too where I probably should edit, especially like the um the pure script record builder stuff. It's like a really nice use of them, but yeah, I just haven't looked into it yet. I mean, I haven't like updated this repo in a while. Can you still contribute if the last anime you watched was seven years ago? Just, I mean, I don't understand any of the references you're making. I think memes can be more than anime. Anime, <laughs> you can invent a new kind of a new kind of meme. Some cat memes. It works. Yeah, there's, a, there's a Pepe Mitchell, Sylvia meme in there. And Hardy used it for some Lambda Conf presentation. <laughs> yeah. I think Tran Ma has the uh, monopoly on, on CAD memes and abstract functional pro uh, FP conf concepts at the moment. But sure, we can challenge her reign at some point. Um, I've got something as long as we're talking about row types and because I got super into validation before the break and decided to add all of the variant stuff to it. If anyone wants to see that. So presentation. <laughs> this is your fault because I was looking at variant to do all the stuff that you mentioned before and I hadn't used variant before and then I use it and it's freaking awesome. Um, it really is. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's see. Close that. All right. Um, so I got kind of into validation before the holidays. Um, just kind of puttered around with the semi group and the semi ring validation stuff. And one of the kind of annoyances was whenever you do a validation, you have to define this kind of error type that's collecting all of your validation errors. And if it's a closed sum, so you know, just like, uh, actually, hold on, I've got a thing with it. Hmm. So like normal validation errors are going to just be a normal sum type. And so we're restricted to performing validation functions that have this validation error type normally. So, you know, I got my validate non empty thing here, and it can only accumulate validation errors that are in this sum. And that's kind of restrictive because it means that we can't really get super granular with the types of errors that someone can throw and extend things and stuff like that. And it turns out that all that's something that row types are really good for. And uh, Nate Fabian made this awesome library called Variant that's basically kind of that. Extensible open sums using row types. Um, whoops. So what it kind of lets me do here is if I want to say write validation functions for the length of something, I can do this thing where I create a type alias for too short 
and this row variable r that is a variant where the error is tagged too short. It's got an int, which is the length of the thing that failed validation, and it's got the r that's saying I can extend this row with other errors in addition to the too short error. And then you get this kind of neat, super, super polymorphic function here. Um, so like for validating minimum length, I can do it over any foldable input um, with the minimum length that the thing has to be, or yeah, and then something within the foldable input, and then I can do the validation in this function. So I've got a little guard that says, if the length of my input is less than or equal to the minimum length that I've supplied, I do this inject thing, which injects a symbol proxy or a string proxy uh, into the variant to tag it, and then I supply it with the length of the input so I know the length that failed validation, and then I just output it as a non-empty list of those things. Um, so this just looks pretty much more complicated than anything that I could have done with some types, and it's kind of not super obvious what the value proposition is here until you get down to too short or too long, where I take the two types of validations and I create a new error type that has both of those tags that were used above again. So I've extended my error type so that validating the length, that the length is between some min length and max length ranges, is just the composition of validate minimum length and validate maximum length. And the error types don't really need to, the error types of maximum and minimum length don't need to know about each other. And all we need to know is that you have this too long or short type that is using the symbols defined for uh, too long and too short above. And so you can do this really granular validation definition and then just compose them together and then now you've got some more complex validation logic. And it keeps working the larger you go. Um, so I've defined a couple other ones here. I've defined like uh, validate non-empty, which I also think is kind of neat because it shows you really how general you can make some of this. So this isn't even like validate that a string is not empty or you know, validate that a list is not empty, it's like validate any monoid. Um, and you know, when you're doing concrete validation functions and you can't necessarily reuse them that much, you need to extend the sums and things like that, you might not want to write something like this because what's the point if you can only use it in one place where you're validating strings anyway, but now you get to do all of this and this can be used anywhere. So anyway, when I go to actually use it, I can say, um, that any email validation, for example, is gonna be something that is non-empty and is not invalid. And these are two types for errors and variants that are defined in the non-empty and then email validation functions over here. And, uh, oh yeah, and right here you can see that before where the row is open, now the row is closed and we can say that we're doing a complete validation and we're not going to extend this anymore. Um, and then validating an email is just composition of validate non-empty and then validate email address. So you can see this is a bad email, it's just some guy's name, and this is a better email. So that's an actual and will pass validation. And um, same thing with password validations, and this is kind of neat too because we're reusing the is empty from above with just a different variant type. Um, and so we're reusing also the too long and too short of separate error types and then has uppercase or has lowercase, but we're only using these three validation functions since mixed case is gonna give you has lowercase or has uppercase and string length is gonna give you too long or too short. And this is just another composition of that. Um, and you can just keep building it up more and more. So like we've got these forms, so like this is an unvalidated form type alias for a record some new types just to show you what validating is gonna kind of be like. And a validation error, which is another variant of the invalid email, the invalid password proxies we defined above. And then an actual proper validation of it. There's this stuff which is kind of gross. There's probably way to make this less gross. I think at this point I was just throwing things at the compiler to make sure that it would stop yelling at me. Um, all this basically does is it uh, maps over the V type, which is a bifunctor, so that in the error case, it does the appropriate tag it with the right variant error type and then wrap it in a singleton uh, non empty list. Or if it's successful, then wrap it in that email new type constructor so that we can produce our actual validated record. But 
the validate the whole form ends up being just a uh, applicative style traversal of this record structure where you tag the email and you tag the password in the success and error cases. So like this is a bad, uh, bad unvalidated form and a good unvalidated form using our bad and good passwords. Bad email, good email, bad password, good password from above. And when it actually runs, you get output like this, where you see all of the things that have failed, um, accumulated in non-empty lists, or you get the proper output. So super, super way more extensible than um, concrete some types are. Oh, and there is this kind of fun thing that I ran into that kind of got discussed in the chat, I think a couple weeks ago, where string isn't traversable. So if you want to do something like validate, or string isn't foldable, so under like validate length, which validates over a foldable structure, you've got it to do, you get it, convert it to a care array, and then from, yeah, to care array, and then from care array to get it back to a string. Because there's no like mono traversable type classes or anything like that. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's validation with row types, and it's pretty sweet. Yeah, it's super good, especially because it turns around your like the way you need to import things, where you don't have that like one module which contains this yet like huge sum type that has to have all these injections, and then yeah, you you can completely uncouple these, and because they're type level strings, they're not actually strings. Like you can't get them wrong. Yeah, so like I can go down here and uh, I actually, so the funny thing is when I was writing this the first time, I mistyped a string and I was so confused because I didn't know where my error was because um, I wasn't used to thinking of strings as causing type errors and it just, I think it was probably like at least 10 or 15 minutes of just trying to figure out what the hell I did wrong. But if I like, and then I rebuild it, it should yell at me. Yeah, there we go. And now it's saying that that's a type error because I can't tag something that only is a variant with has lowercase with this thing that it just doesn't understand. But if I change it to and now it's fine with that. Yeah, this is just this is really, really pleasant. The added bonus, um, depending on how you want to use all of his validation stuff is that variant also has a runtime representation that JavaScript is just a okay with. They're just normal JavaScript objects um, that have a key for type and then uh, another key for like the actual parsed value out or uh, the, or yeah, that. And so what you can do is you can make your error type or I think variant exposes its error type as a, a separate key. So you can actually FFI this from JavaScript, like write your validation functions in pure script, FFI it from JavaScript, and then you get stuff you can actually just use. Um, you get stuff like, like this, actually. So you can call pure script from JavaScript and then get stuff that's actually sane out when you try and validate something which is really, really neat as a value proposition for pure script in a small way. Because the JavaScript code, I don't think even looks terrible. Yeah, so like I can define these forms in JavaScript here and then uh, import validate form from pure script. And then when I run it, I can actually like, this is just like calling a JavaScript function anyway. So like you can make this and then anyone will be able to use it. That's awesome. That's very much in the spirit of script. Yeah. Uh, the non empty list stuff is pretty gross. There's a way to probably make that a lot better, but I, I just didn't care about parse errors at the time. It just was super excited that the validation errors came out in a way that's sane. I mean, like, this is an array of all the different errors. So, like, this is actually super helpful for someone calling it just from normal JS because you can traverse this and then just look for the types of errors that you encountered and then get granular information if you want. There's no super weird pure script compiler artifacts showing up. Yeah, you probably go from a non-empty list of errors into a string before you expose the function to JavaScript because yeah, that's like the universal JavaScript data type. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it would be nice to expose some more structure. And yeah, the 
not empty list does not have a nice type in. Yeah. JavaScript land. You could make it a non-empty array, which would just be an array in JavaScript. Yeah, that's a, that's one of the things I was thinking of. Like, you could just make a final prepare for FFI or whatever that goes through and does the conversion to an array, um, which since it's the same runtime rep too, it just looks nice and pleasant. But yeah, the the all the variant stuff with validation was, I was surprising. Uh, it was really satisfying to write. I'll, I'll put it that way, because you get all of this reusability. And like Christoph was saying, you don't have this thing where you've got a, you know, types.error module or whatever that you have to pull in that has your giant some type of errors that just keeps getting bigger and bigger the more types of base validations you use. Um, now all of the logic for validating a particular type of thing is pulled into its module. Um, and then when I want to build complex validators, I actually import the specific ones that I want to use, nothing more, nothing less. And like, uh, I don't actually even have to pull in the types um, specifically, and it'll still type check as I want it to. So, you know, like, if I'm only using the validate email address function, I don't have to pull in the type explicitly. I can just create my own variant with his empty and invalid email as I need to use it. So it makes your import list nicer, which is a nice added bonus. Yeah, I've, I've found that I keep running into these situations where I'm like, oh my, variant is really nice for this use case. So the three things I have now is like, yeah, error types generally, because you want to define errors at the place where they occur. And at some point, they will be pulled together, but you don't want to define that error type. And then another thing I ran into was dialogues, because again, like a big UI, and you define these dialogues in different places. And again, you pull them together at the end somewhere, but you don't want to define the master dialogue necessarily. Um, what's the other one? I ran into one more, which was really satisfying. I can't think of it. But anyway, yeah, it's, it's like so extensible, or I don't know, you can easily pull out some of these validators into their own library, and you can mix and match them as you want. Like you, know, you need to have one library that consolidates them into one big error type for others to consume. Yeah, I got to imagine that would be really, really useful if you had, you know, a big project say at work that does a bunch of this type of stuff. And then as you find things that are useful for maybe one or more different applications, you can break them out into packages and still get all that modularity. And I'll get one, all one thing that you're going to find really fun is if you, try, if you write a show or like a print function for these things, for these variants, is that if you have the big sum type, right, if you pull these together, so if you want to define the sum, like the show for that big thing, is that you need to write the function which dispatches to the individual show functions, right? What you can do here is you just string them together with the hash, like one after another. And once all the cases are handled, you just put a case underscore, and then it's done. Ooh. Um, so like, uh, like this down here when you're handling all that stuff? Yeah, exactly. Yes. But the on part just disappears because you do the on with uh, like on label. You do that with the validation where the validation error is defined. Mm, right. And then what you do is you just you do like uh, print to short print to something. Uh, yeah, you just pull these together and they just magically combine to handle the entire ADT that you've defined. Or like that's that. awesome. So how does, you've got all the string there. What, I'm trying to figure out what the end result, because it's returning a string. Is it basically short? It's shortcutting, right? It's going to return you one of those errors. Am I correct on that? Sorry, all the string. It's got foo with bar, baz, et cetera. But that's, uh, that, because that's, like, that's case in quotation marks, um, that, is that, that going to return one of the errors? I was just trying to figure out how to have it return a big list of, um, there is, or sorry, I, I made a misunderstanding. 
Yeah, does a variant contain just one of those, like foobar bass, or does it contain uh, yeah. multiple of those? Yes, exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just uh, like a sum type, except you can extend the sum type like you would. Like, it's the the dual, as it were, to the notion of an extensible product type, which is a record in pure script. So you've got this notion of a of a product type that can be extended by some row r. Well, a variant is a union, or like at some type, you could extend by some row V here. Yeah, so it's like, what? Polymorphic variant or untagged union, or even some languages call them union types. Is a, you're losing, so you're losing exhaustivity here, but um, you are, uh, yeah, you, you meaning you well, can you, have something you can get which it back. Is, which is yeah. the nice oh, that's right. Sorry, yeah, because the extensible versus the... Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, so, so all you have to do is close the row, and you're done. Bam, exhaustivity, which is why case is exhaustive, and why when you want to convert something from an extended row to a concrete final value, like, say, string, you have to provide a default to give you exhaustivity. Cool. Thanks. And uh, Christoph might be able to correct me on this, but case will only compile with a closed row, I'm pretty sure, right? Yes. Yeah. Case is absurd, by the way. <laughs> oh, right. Like the actual literal function absurd? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Where are you? Ah, whatever. It's somewhere over here. Yeah, also, um, I just want to say right here, Nate's uh, code is 100% of the time great to read. It's either well commented or it just looks nice. So go check his libraries out if you haven't. Yeah, I had to look through the uh, source code of the PureScript F, uh, JavaScript FFI, because his latest rewrite put a lot of that stuff into JavaScript for speed, speed reasons. And uh, when he was uh, showing it to us uh, a few months ago, like I was pretty skeptical, like this is, like I, if I have to debug this, there's no way I would be able to do it. But I was trying to read through it just this last week, and it takes like, you, you kind of have to understand like a few concepts, but like otherwise it's pretty readable. Um, if you just kind of map the JavaScript concept to the PureScript concept that's he's put in the JavaScript comments, it's surprisingly understandable. Yeah, for a runtime system embedded in JavaScript, uh, this is something like 1,100 lines, and it's not crazy esoteric, and it's well commented, and it's readable. So that, that gets some kind of trophy or something. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all I got. Thanks a lot, Joe. That's cool. Yeah, that was super cool. Yeah, Glad I planted the seed and variant in your head. <laughs> <laughs> I posted it in the chat, but yeah, I have a demo library thing. Or I, actually, I have an actual library that like takes the variant errors to like another level of crazy and uses that for actual symbols. So you're supposed to like extract out the symbols for your errors. And then, uh, and the, um, the symbols come from the labels for the actual rules that you apply by having like uh, a row of, of uh, the different rules that you want to apply. So it uses a type class mechanism to match some validation rules. Yeah, that's your home run ball, right? Yeah, home run ball. Home run ball. It's a good library name. <laughs> it's not ambiguous like other things. You, yeah, mean, you, I mean, you make it easy it. for Joe to find a, a repo name on GitHub. <laughs> you got a naming convention. Some people like name things after Greek gods, and you know, but Nate, you food. It's yeah, food, crazy snacks, and yep. I could share my desktop even. Um, let's see. 
So today I wrote up about this uh, demo I did for like high level paths. So the library is fittingly called LA Cogby, right? It's like this barbecue, it has these segments, right? So it reminds you of path, path segments like this, right? Yeah, it immediately comes to mind. You can, you can see it as associated. <laughs> Yeah. It follows directly, Justin. It's completely clear. <laughs> and then, yeah, home run ball, you know, it's, it's this thing. And actually, like, these these rules are like the biscuit that's in the uh, outside of this thing, and the value is this <laughs> The same rule applies for my Tortellini library. Oh. Tortellini is actually, like, makes complete sense. You, you, can't, you can't joke about that one. It's got a, mo a modern artist, truly. It's got I and I in it, so it's totally me, of course. And the you error your, has been. You you your PSC error. package tax. Oh, yeah. Or, uh, the errors come up to oh spaghettios, because each error is an oh spaghetti. <laughs> it only makes sense. <laughs> you said there's that package thing? You your your PSC package stuff, the stuff that you forked off. Show show people what you tagged the release names. Oh my PS, you mean yeah, my package your, sets? your specific ones. Oh yeah. Yeah, your package set. Sorry, I forgot what that word was. Yeah, lasagna, rendang, persimmon, fricandella, baguette, home row, home shell roll. Package management was never tastier. <laughs> do these do these names matter at all? Uh, food. Do they matter? No, I, 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 I said supposed to be like type. name like the version of the Pisco compiler they support. I'm not sure. P PSC package is a little bit. Uh, no, but these are my package sets. I, I'm using them. Yeah, that's for the default package sets. The one that um, like. Uh, right, but I'm curious how the PSC package uh, chooses which package set to pull down. Uh, just by like, version. You, oh, get, you just put it. Back. You just put it into the file for your repo. Whenever you do like init, it just chooses the current one. So I do like, uh, no, how can that already exist? You see package init, then the, <laughs> the default one in there is, uh, yeah, 0 0.11. I mean, That's 0 0.7. So that corresponds to a branch somewhere? Yeah. This is a branch inside the repo. Okay, tag, okay. Right? It's a tag, not a branch. Oh, yeah, it's a tag. You can tag. make it, it this, this also will point to a branch. So what, what's the releases to, used yeah. for? The releases are tags. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay. But I th I th okay, so these aren't tied to a certain compiler version, right? Well, not really, yeah. You can just change it to whatever you want. So like my vid checker thing, I think I'm using one of mine. So I'm using lasagna from my releases, and it has all these things. So yeah, the way you'd usually work with this is you'd probably fork off the one that corresponds to the compiler version you're currently using. Then you keep adding until you've got all the stuff in that you care about. And then if you're feeling great, like if you're feeling nice, then you contribute that back to the like that work that you did for solving for versions you contribute that back to the main package set so that everyone else can benefit from that work yeah and most of my stuff i've like pr back but some of them are like libraries that i don't know if other people want to use ever so yeah i haven't contributed those yeah, I think that's one that's one tricky problem is like deciding which libraries to throw out once you get into conf once you get build conflicts. Like are yeah. the ones that are in the package set, do they always get preference over the ones that you're trying to add? I mean when we were upgrading like F four point oh, we dropped some of them just because like they were like not updated for like a month and it was hard to get them to actually like build. But then like eventually the ones that people cared about got added back in. But at the same time, it's like forking your own thing and then validating a single package is so easy now. Mostly thanks to me, or actually mostly thanks to like people complaining and their ideas about how to fix it. So like adding a package, uh, yeah, I think it was here where we 
talk about how you can verify single packages. So this this workflow, like I, I, like Hardy was the main person like complaining about this, and then I implemented some of this. So it's like this package set thing is actually very hard to do. I mean, Stackage effectively does something where they basically, when they're they're cutting a new release, they test it, and things that don't work, they just post issues. I, I think that's probably the best way to handle it. Like, you just compile everything, and then whatever doesn't work, you just let someone know, hey, this thing broke. And if you want to be in this package set, we'll fix it. Yeah, the problem is that do you just always ban the one that depends on something? Which one? Which one of the two is at fault? Basically, if two things don't compile with the same version, always the one that doesn't work with the latter. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I guess that one's an opinionated decision. Like, you probably have a core set of libraries that you know you have to keep in, and then choose based on what you think people use a lot of. I guess. Yeah, because I remember Stackish had that problem with bumping ASON, which they basically couldn't for a long time because that would have like invalidated half of the uh, half of the package set that they had. Yeah. By the way, Justin, I just checked. I'm actually using uh, your Samosa package set for something that's not just like a personal <laughs> project. Like a oh, yeah? teeny teeny work project has your Samosa package set. Because I needed like Milkis and Simple JSON together or something. <laughs> nice. Those are actually in the main package set now. I think. I think this so, was like back in late October or like November or something, and it might have been back around the AF4 stuff. So not everything was working with AF4, and you had a bunch of custom branches pulled in. This is definitely super rickety. Yeah, Simple JSON and Milkis are in here. This is good. I wonder if Chocopy is in here. Nope. So, yeah, just some of the more important ones. There's five of my packages in here. Well, also as a call to action, people should be writing some blog posts, right? Just any topic will do. Like I wrote about like how like I have better. I just upgraded the types I'm using in the tracker over time. So like I started with like simple whatever stuff that like always broke if I like got the URL wrong or if I got the type wrong. And then like about how I use phantom types, but then there are some parts that I left in the thing and then how I upgraded to like uh, just a phantom type that doesn't even have values. And then I just like reflect the symbol as I need it. So I wrote about that and then I wrote about like Simple JSON examples I did a couple of months ago about like different things, like changing field name, changing uh, field to like some different that thing. That signature like parsing a oh, good. thing. What what signature? Where? <laughs> which one? This one? Modify is pretty good, but was there one which was even longer? I think even longer. Yeah, that one. <laughs> what in the hell? Uh, oh yeah, if you like implement rename, it like looks like this, of course. Yeah, because it's like I mean, the, the two just totally, symbols. Yeah, the usage is just super easy. But. Yeah, the actual usage is like just this. But this, like, you don't even like need to uh, have this because I put it into uh, into Pierce record. Because like someone yeah. actually asked about this, but like I already did it. I remember myself being like, uh, I did a rename thing. I, I was paired with Gary, and I was like. I wrote out all the fields and I copied over the ones that were common and I renamed that one. And he was like, "Why don't you just use the like from data record the rename one?" And I totally forgot that we can do that kind of thing now. It's like so happy when I when I actually worked. Yeah. <laughs> and also, uh, I wrote this one just today, but this is about like path params, like being parts of records, because like. People are like posting all these examples in like other programming languages where like they're pattern matching on an array with like string literal segments, like just string values, and then like the actual like segments as like variable bindings. So it's like you know two things that don't work is like if you want to use this information in any other context, or if you want to like have variables that should be parsed to integer, then like you end up having like boilerplate everywhere. So like. 
yeah, I just wrote about how I use like um, tuple and string proxies just renamed, and then uh, param where I defined it. And so like if a param ID and name and inted string, then that parses into a record, and then you can just use record like uh, just fine like here. So it's like hello world one Joe, and then like parses that out and result that name result the ID. So I don't know. This isn't going to be like a this isn't like a real library, but like if someone wanted to do this for like their actual um their actual work code base, then they could. But yeah. Just a call to action that people should write some blog posts. Because sharing is caring or something like that. Do you have a blog post on writing better blog posts? Because all we got <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> so my workflow of writing blog posts is I write up a demo oh, like in a couple hours or something. I try to think of something during work because I'm bored. And I <laughs> a demo. And then the next day I go to like a couple of coffee shops or the library and I wrote crap. Just like I mean, you've read my blog post, right? They're not very good like writing. They're not good prose. They're usually grammatically incorrect, but you know, just needs to be out there. It's like take your Slack messages and put them into a blog post. Or like you should write out a bunch of Slack messages and then pipe them into a markdown file and then publish it. I want something coherent, and that wouldn't be. <laughs> um, also, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but that advice is 100% draw two circles, draw the rest of the fucking owl. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I don't know. I used to write like outlines for myself like in an org file and then like write it out, but then I realized that like I just write a one linear blob, so it didn't really work. But I guess the general rule is that your blog post should be like uh, like 250, 400 words per section, and there should be like four sections, I think. I don't know what to tell you. I have another call for action. I've been doing a lot of Rust lately, and the builder pattern is so fun, and we should use more of it. Like build more DSLs that do build-up pattern things instead of taking records as arguments. You can still use records for that, like insert as the builder goes through, you insert stuff, and so you make sure that you can't insert the same field twice or something. And I'm going to write a blog post with an example of doing that for sure. Because we have one of these things in some data, and it's like actually kind of pleasant to use. So, um, We're going to hold you to it. <laughs> Damn it. Give me the recording. <laughs> yeah, the, especially the nice thing about the PureScript record builder thing was is that like it's actually a semigroup in a category. Like, holy shit! If I had uh, if I had one hundredth of a penny for every time a JavaScriptor lied to me and told me something was composable, I'd be a billionaire by now. Uh, uh, well, I, I got to get off the meeting here. Um, I'm going to, yeah, but I guess you guys can stay on and chat a little bit more. Yeah, it's going to be over two hours. <laughs> yeah. I think it's good. Got to gotta say something for next ne next month. Yeah. yeah. Unless anyone has more questions that they want to answer. Yeah, it's, it's been fun chatting. <laughs> I ho hope to see you. Uh, a few people at uh, the hack meet up in a few weeks. Okay. I got some good project ideas, finally. Cool.